you can go to studyspine.com. It's a new website I put together. My old one is neckandback.com. So you can give, I want you to give some input regarding this course and how to improve the lecture series and put things that I've missed or haven't perfectly explained and give me feedback. That's very important. We'll have a case of the month and a radiologic case of the month for you to review on the site. And all you have to do is register. There's no charge to participate. And the other question I have is, do you guys want a private forum? I have a forum for patients, but I don't have a forum for professionals. And people do ask questions on the patient forum, but if somebody's really interested, we can talk about putting a forum together, but give me feedback regarding that. So, neckandback.com. Feel free to refer individuals, patients, to neckandback.com to have them learn about a disorder. It's disorder-specific. So if they don't know what's wrong, they can read, but they're not going to get as much information. I do not solicit patients, so you don't have to worry about that. And you can use this as a site for a resource for information regarding spinal disorders. The forum, you can gain a lot of knowledge here because everybody who writes in has had a wrong diagnosis or poor surgical outcome. And you can see what you do. So you can ask questions on the forum and I'll answer each and every inquiry and it's separ separated into individual titled segments so search is easy but there's probably 10,000 responses on there so you can see at least how I think that has nothing to do with this question so I will do one problem that I do consult on long-distance consults so if patients are living in Nebraska Florida, Europe, Australia, I will charge them, but I'll spend 30 to 40 minutes on the phone with them going over their images and talking about treatment. So there's no patient-doctor relationship that develops, so if they do want to see me, they have to come face-to-face, -face, unfortunately. And there's office preceptorships. So you can come to the Vail Clinic on clinic days to observe new patient workups, I think probably the most valuable or you want to come on surgery days to observe a spine operation, you're welcome to do that. Or you can spend a couple of days, three days, and spend your time in the clinic, and I think it's quite valuable. And so you just call Lori, you know, back there, and that's her phone number. So I'm sorry, Lori, I had to give it out. So if you want to do this, you can do that. So now, that can be helpful, but... How do you determine a good spine surgeon or a good neurosurgeon? Well, you can't ask them, but you have to find out what the results are. It does help to see if they've written things on the subject, if they've written papers. But there's an old saying, is those who can do and those who can't teach. So you've got to be careful with that, too. Do you have any ideas, Sonny? Gosh, you know, I've been sitting here thinking about that. And there's a Netflix on Dr. Death. <laughs> you guys have uh, heard of this guy? Yeah. Just an absolute anomaly yeah. and aberration to our profession. This guy, uh, you've heard of him? He's a neurosurgeon. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> so, uh, so, you've heard, so he had a lot of unfortunate events, but I think some of them were purposeful. And he would probably have said to you that he was very good yeah. surgeon. And I had been mulling it over as long as he's been talking about the epilogue. And I thought to myself, how did I pick my dentist? Right? Because that's another thing. You know, because everyone wants a good dentist, because you don't have any cavity. Right? If he tells you you have four cavities in your mouth, all right, I mean, you're going to drill, make a hole, and fill it. Sounds good. So there's a trust. And I think when I look at it, I said, is this someone who is trustworthy enough, somebody that I can look in the eye and talk to me? as a coherent thought process, number one, right? Develop that. Much like you developed with Dr. Fisher. Number two, I think what Dr. Corman says is just is such an irony. Those that can do and those that can't teach, but I think you have to also have that. Because here he has just built this amazing two-day lecture. Clearly he can teach and do. So I think you have to have that yin yang of meshing of Hey, did you look at your results? Did you see that you had a good excellent rate in your ACDNFs or in your discapacities? What's your irrigation rate? Right? Are you willing to follow yourself? 
I always say to people, I just joke around, so you never get to rotate off your own surface. Right? As if you're a resident. Yeah, so that's a, you're always seeing your follow-ups, and I think the critical part is maybe yeah. looking at it, obviously, in publishers. Number two, publish it, look at it, and I always tell people, here's my data. Here are my radiation rates. Here are my ECDNF results. I think there's no fear of science in being able to show that. And I think number three, you know, which is the intangible, you know, is seeing their demeanor, their personality in the office, um, seeing how they teach through, because we, even when we're operating teaching, you know, whether it's our stroke tech, our, our PA, or someone said, or as a fellow, and if you take someone with that interest and personality, they're not doing it just for a job, they're doing it because it's their calling. Um, and I think that's why all of you guys are here on a Sunday. And I know that's why Dr. Foreman's written a book on our website, done these lectures. It's a calling. I want to be drawn to that. I think that separates people who go to work and put their best foot forward every day, whether you're a lawyer, a dentist, physical therapist, teacher, or you do because this is what you're supposed to do. It's very good and so intangible. I can't tell you, but you know, right? You know. And it's that old Malcolm Gladwell book is that you don't have to describe what, you know, prejudice or hatred or, or, or niceties are. You just know the sense of it. Right? You make a million judgments. I think the book's called Blink. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you make a million judgments in the book of mind, I think you can probably say, you know, that'd be a pretty good option. Probably knows the stuff. But it doesn't help when he's in Idaho. So, you know, I actually tried to develop a system to rate docs, and there isn't the information out there. You can't know about dural leak rates. You can't know about infection rates. You can't know about success rates because they're not published. They're not available to be published. And so I don't know how to, I wish I could. This is the billion dollar question, but I can't answer it. And even amazingly, you know, whether you're 30 years of practice, 15 years of practice, or one day in practice, we're given the same insurance, you know, approval stamp. This is the sponsor of this for you know, I don't know if that's the best way either. Maybe we have to assess our own. I do think insurance companies are starting to collect data now, yeah. but they're not going to give it out. But it'd be nice to be able to have that data to see because they call their patients their patients are not patients. They call their clients 60 days, 90 days, a year out, and they send them questionnaires, how you doing? Yeah. And so that data would be invaluable, but it's not available. That may be the next step. So to continue on that, there are other education requirements that you think you may have touched on today. So because I have another, for example, neuro guys. There are neuro guys and there are spine. Two people do the same thing. The interesting thing about neuro versus spine is that spine surgeons have been doing this since the beginning, since dinosaurs walked the earth. Neurosurgeons generally get into neurosurgery to do brain surgery, find out there isn't enough business to do brain surgery, and end up doing spine surgery. There can be some very fine, very good neurosurgeons and there can be some very bad spine surgeons. But in general, I'm not gonna, Sonny, am I putting my foot in my mouth? Uh, you know, it's, it's so hard. You know, I, you have the wisdom of age and you to say I, I try to just, this is where I let my mentor take over. Well, I can give you one statistic. 50% of the work that I do is revision surgery for failure from patients to come in from other places. 80% of those patients are neurosurgical patients. So that's the only statistic I'll give, and I, I will swear I never said it if you ever ask me to say it again. We're not filming this, are we? Okay. We'll cut this part off. <laughs> I do. I have a guy, a neurosurgeon, uh, Lee Nelson, who I like a lot. Yeah, so I send them to him. He's in Boulder. Well, same thing.
What's that? C12s. Yeah. I don't do them anymore. I'm too old to be doing them. I want... What's that? No, you're a C23. Oh, you don't even know. God. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Uh, this is a patient question. <laughs> no, it's okay. A woman came to ask him for a visit, and on the last day, she had had um, drop foot and knee pain in the left leg, and she had a surgery. She looked in the chamber of walls and was going to accept me. And how long ago was the surgery? That was um, in the spring of this year, I believe, the beginning of the summer. The surgery completely resolved all of her symptoms. And two months later, she developed drop foot on the right side. The opposite she, side of the surgery? The opposite side. So she, by the time she was going to, she was heard about this, she wanted to be like, and I think she already had it probably maybe even two months or so. She said she's since had an MRI, uh, another MRI, and her children said the surgery was fine, there was nothing going on. She had had three epidurals since, and no uh, change whatsoever in Well, then ask yourself, what can cause drop foot other than compression of the nerve in the canal? Yes. And the gal's on a plane with her legs sitting on a seat laying right next to it. The first thing I think of if there's nothing going on in the canal is to look at the common perineal nerve entrapment, the lateral fibular head. So, and the best way to test for that is an EMG NCV. And that's the one lecture we didn't touch on today. But that is the one benefit that EMG and CVs talk about, is trying to find out where the root is compressed. Now, you can have mononeuritis, that can occur, but that would be rare. So I would think the first thing to look at is a common perineal. Percuss over the common perineal nerve. It's, if it zaps down, I know, but, but that's what you do. You start to think out of the box what's going to cause it other than looking at a root compression. So if the MRI is clean and it's on the opposite side anyway, so we know it's not a chronic radic, that's the first thing I'd look at. Other questions? Yes? Well, it depends on how severe the symptoms are and what the symptoms are. But to me, an x-ray is inevitable if somebody's got significant pain and they've been treated for it for anywhere from six weeks to three months and it's still there. You need to find out what's going on. Kids, as you see, get all sorts of mechanical disorders and they, x-rays are important. And I would do that on kids, scoliograms. I mean, look at all the kids. If you've got a kid with scoliosis, they're going to get radiated. So you have to deal with that. So if you remember, if they fly across the country, you would one time a year have the same amount of radiation as one more bar in the future. So that's where you can kind of have a Swedish or an MRI is no radiation. And living at altitude like this is the consistency of a CT scan a year. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting plenty of radiation from other sources. It is. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you the other day, but I um, knew we'd like to deal with it too, but the question that Bill applies, and you brought up what else, uh, non-organic signs. And, uh, so is there any thought on the, I think you call it amplification. Well, first of all, there most likely needs to be secondary gain. So there is a cause for their injury, a motor vehicle accident, a work cop injury. That's the first thing that triggers my spidey sense, as I like to say. And so I'm a little cautious about their history. Most people still have genuine injuries that may just be a little slower to get better. Malingering is a whole different animal. And most people, I mean, I've probably seen about 10 or 12 malingering cases in my entire career. But it may be higher in certain areas than others. Do you, do you send people to counseling before considering? If I'm concerned that 
they're unaware of their mechanical problem or how surgery can affect them, without a shadow of a doubt, they go to at least a psychiatric or psychological consultation. But most people that I see, it's a pretty straightforward, you've got a C6-7 compression and a C7 radiculopathy. I don't care how crazy you are, <laughs> you probably need to have that fixed. Other questions? Well, you guys, you made it through. My voice did too, which is amazing. So thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Feedback in the mechanism would be great. Thank you so much. <laughs>